You're watching Beyond Markets, where we bring you up to speed on development outcomes in Africa. I'm Kenneth Iboma, and thank you so much for joining me on the show. Today, our focus is on migrant remittances, and we'll find out how we can keep the flows going in the middle of a pandemic. You can join the conversation on social media. Let me know what you think. The hashtag to use is Beyond Market. You can also hit me up on my handle. That's at Kenneth Ibomo. And let's get that conversation going and, and get your thoughts about what you think about what we discuss. Now, a joint report by One Campaign and the Economic Commission for Africa says the wealthy economies of North America, Europe, and Middle East host a large share of African migrants who are the source of more than half of total remittances sent to Africa. Based on the World Bank projections, the Economic Commission for Africa projects that remittance flows into Africa could decline by 21% in 2020, implying um, about 18 billion less uh, will go to people who rely on that money. To explore how to protect this important economic lifeline, my guests for this conversation today are Sarah Maka Ubage, she's the Nigeria Director for One Campaign. I also have Stephen Karingi, the Director for, um, for Regional Integration and Trade Division at the Economic Commission for Africa. And last but definitely not the least is Nancy Onyango. She's a contributing editor and writer at All Africa. Thank you so much for uh, joining me on the show today. And uh, let me start with the ladies first and try to understand uh, what this problem that we're dealing with. Starting first with Tara, uh, I'd like you to speak on the COVID-19 disruptions we're seeing across the world and uh, the cross-sectoral impact we're seeing it play out. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, yes, COVID-19, as everyone knows, has wreaked really havoc around the world. And I think that one of the things that is affecting Africa more than other places is the economic impact. So while the health impact is impact is affecting us, we haven't seen as deep an impact on healthcare as much as we've seen in other parts of the world. However, we have seen that economic impact really enter into um, our, our, our economic lives across the continents. We've seen um, revenues fall because commodity prices have been affected. We're seeing gl global supply chain uh, chains contracting. We're seeing that African finance ministers are asking for an economic stimulus um, to relieve debt of a hundred billion dollars. Across the world, we've seen the United States give themselves over $2 trillion to, to absorb the impact of COVID. We're seeing the EU give themselves about 2 trillion euros to absorb that impact. Even China gave itself about $7 billion to absorb that impact. Africa is asking for $100 billion because wages are lower, income is lower, food security is, 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 is gaining uh, importance in our radar, people's incomes are lower. And so we really do need to double down the economic impact and remittances hold a key to that. All right, but for you, Nancy, though, what do you see when you, when you look at the COVID-19 impact, especially on migrant workers and their families? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's uh, like like from the stories that I've been working on. I mean, recently I I interviewed uh, Isaac Mutua, who's a Kenyan living in South Africa. He works as a chef. And uh, I mean, Isaac's story um, is, I mean, is, is so sad in the sense that um, he's been sending uh, $300 monthly to his family, which has been going towards um, uh, going towards food and going towards medicine for his five-year-old who's diabetic. And also part of the money that he sends has been going to his, uh, his mother, um, who lives in Kajiado, towards his uh, poultry and tomato farming um, so with the no money because he's um, uh, he's he actually lost his uh, his job um, uh, seven months ago when the pandemic uh, with the pandemic uh, unfolding and with the lockdown regu regulations the resort that he used to work in South Africa also shut down so it means that uh, with him uh, not having a job not having money um, his family who depends on him as the sole breadwinner all the way uh, here in Kenya is unable to to have money for food they now uh, depend on donations and also if you look at it in the bigger picture um, uh, the investment project that started in Cajiado for tomatoes and uh, and poultry is also not doing well because he's unable to now send money towards the farm inputs and as you know agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to the Ken Kenyan economy so if we have that uh, failing it means that the lives of many people who depend on that industry is 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 uh, is just going to be shut. So I think um, uh, for, from my uh, for, from from where I sit and from what, what I'm seeing from the from the stories that I've worked on, I've, I've worked on. There's really need for us to look at this uh, remittances 
critically, particularly for the migrant, migrant workers who actually need to send money. And uh, Isaac is among the many who are actually sending money. And uh, if it cost him uh, uh, $20 to send $300, uh, uh, $300 dollars i mean it's 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 a big chunk of the money and if you if you do the math and you see like um if it's isaac and uh, many other people who actually depend on that it just shows you the grim statistics that you are looking at many people are unable now to go to hospitals many people are unable to buy food so i think there's just uh, more need for for african governments to just take this seriously particularly um uh, in situations where uh, for him he doesn't have a, a work permit he's status i mean he's unable to actually do anything so how can we progress in a situation like that and also the the payout locations um are not as many as 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 uh, as as they need to be also the ease of sending money i mean you need to have like if you're in, in south africa where i've lived before you need to have an id you need to have a proof of residence you need to have your contract every time you go to the western union and money money moneygram offices i mean uh, for somebody who wants to just send a hundred dollars i mean it's it's crazy to have to produce all that and that a hundred dollars is what somebody would want to send to their mother or to their daughter for um emergencies so we also just very need to look at critical issues like yeah. that yeah, very, very fascinating story there about Isaac, and it actually puts a face to the story because when we talk about remittances here, you know, we just think about the word, but then when you look, when you really whittle it down to the impact we're seeing on people, then the story just comes alight and you understand why there a lot more needs to be done on this front. And let me hear from um, Mr. Stephen here and let him, uh, you know, talk about this remittance sector and uh, how, how, why it's important, it's a very important economic lifeline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as, uh, as my two sisters have said, uh, there is a macro story as uh, presented by Sarah and a micro and livelihood story as Nancy has presented it. Uh, first on the macro story, um, African governments uh, actually had it when it comes to the issue of the fiscal resources that they need to be able to service the debt that our countries have. At the same time, they, are also, they also need to provide uh, social safety net or social safety transfers to the population. Now, what most people don't realize is that the remittances are actually an important part of creating that macro environment that would allow the currencies that uh, are used when it comes to looking at the macro picture to be stable. So when you have remittances that are declining for those countries that are actually attract a lot of uh, remittances, like Nigeria or like Kenya or like Egypt, you are likely to see some of these macro impacts on what is happening on the exchange rates. Uh, you see the, uh, the exchange rates of these countries actually falling in value, and that has an implication when it comes to providing services to, to, to the population and also when it comes to servicing, to servicing them. But the, the bigger story is actually when you look at the, the livelihood uh, remittances can be seen as part and parcel of financing development, but much more importantly, as an important tool for dealing with um, the ability of African countries to achieve the sustainable development goals. There is an, an interconnection when it comes to looking at the poverty implications of um, decline in remittances. Uh, there is also an interlinkage of that, as we have heard from Nancy, when it comes to issues of access to health, Access to, access to education. So what I would want to highlight as our report that talks about here is that the $18 billion that are likely to be a reduction in terms of what Africa is going to, re to receive this year is going to have a macro impact and a micro impact. And we argue that it may even go to as far as having an intergenerational issue because when mothers who are depending on their, on their, on their adult children uh, who are migrants and who are providing resources through remittances, being unable to send uh, money home. It uh, means that the, their grandchildren who are living with them may not be able to go to school. And our report does actually argue that it even has an implication uh, when it comes to issue of gender equality, because uh, it turns out that when a family has to make a choice between who to go back to school because of loss of income, it tends to be the case that the boy may go back to school and then the girl is left back at home. 
So this remittance, this remittance story is uh, not just a macro issue or just a micro issue. It actually has a base, like the example that we have had actually from, from Nancy, or this case of, the, of Mr. Mutua, who is based in South Africa. Definitely the impact here we see, as you rightly mentioned, with us both the macro side as well and the micro. Uh, but let's get to Sarah now. And, and so Sarah, let's, let's get into this new paper that is out here uh, from the One Campaign and, and, and the ECA. And I'd like to get to understand, uh, you know, what some of the key findings that came out for you when you, when you went on this, on this uh, journey. Sure. Um, on the report that the One Campaign and UNECA uh, jointly uh, developed, what we found is 800 million people in the world um, use accept remittances. That's a significant number. We find that the cost of remittances to Africa is higher than the cost of sending money to other parts like Asia. So to sending money to Asia is about 5% to Africa is 8%. And I think something is even more disturbing in our finding. The cost of sending money within Africa, intra-Africa uh, uh, channels are even more expensive, about 14% on average. So we are seeing that there is a cost issue both to Africa and within Africa. And this is something that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement can really look into. I think it's also worth noting that we have a goal as the world. We have SDGs goals and we have that remittances should be about 3% just because of the impact remittances have on the economy. And we're far from that goal. So there's something we need to pay attention to. Sometimes we say the word remittances and people just say, right, okay, yes, sending... All right, but Nancy, from what you said as a writer, someone who uh, is a journalist yourself, when you see this goal that, is, that, that we need to achieve, though, what, what comes to your mind? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's also just looking at, if you're talking about intra-Africa, I think it's also just looking at ease to access. How can we enable them, how can we enable migrants to move money quickly? And uh, I mean, the money is used for simple things that you'd think of like groceries it's to buy medicine i mean to buy farm inputs you're in uh, like if you're in south africa you want to move money to zimbabwe how can you do that and we've seen i mean lots of innovative um, ideas and uh, and and practices coming coming from uh, new players so mukuru uh, during the um the the COVID pandemic uh, when it started actually they um they they introduced um basically a, a, a system where somebody can actually buy groceries in uh, in south africa you pay for it and it can actually be you can actually collect it in zimbabwe so something like that makes it easy for somebody who's in another african country to be able to support their other their families without basically going into a money transfer a payout or a pay-in location and going through the stress because you just need if, if it's groceries that you need, um, you can have that. Also, we have M-Pesa, which has also made it easy um, because you cannot j just simply load money uh, in your M-Pesa and somebody uh, in the other part uh, of, of the world uh, uh, in, within Africa can actually access it. And uh, in Kenya, as an example, uh, some, of the, some of the changes that have happened during the pandemic include just uh, making the e-wallet uh, access easier by increasing the limits of the, of, of the transactions that somebody could have, daily transactions, also um, a, a, a reductions or no cost when you're moving money from your, um, from your bank account to your, to your MPES or your e-wallet. So, so, so changes and developments like these are actually making it easy for um, for migrants to actually be able to move money and also for the recipients to move money because it's not just also the, man, the migrants uh, sending money, it's also the recipients. If you have to travel 100 kilometers to receive $100 and use, I don't know, $50 in the process, I mean, it's also like the money is still being eaten up and the money that you could have used, I mean, you, you will not receive it because it's it's going to other costs. So I think it's also just looking at at the, at the ease and um, with, with such developments, I think it's it's making it, it it's easier. And uh, I think the the mobile operators and the financial institutions come 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 to play here in terms of coming up with policies and regulations and plans and products that actually make it easy for. Uh, a, a, a significant population because like according to the world bank you're looking at 20 percent of the of the african population actually relying on uh, remittances and if it's in kenya where you have 51 million people i mean if 20 percent who are 
uh, relying on that, uh, seventy-five percent of the uh, of the seventy-five uh, percent of the fifty-one million are actually unemployed uh, and under the age of thirty-five. I mean, it's just a big reality. I mean, that we just need to take it more seriously and see how can we support the livelihoods of many people who depend on the remittances, not just for their own upkeep, but also to just keep uh, key sectors of the economy, such as agriculture, going. So that's that's how I look at it. All right, then. Still talking about the realities, then. Stephen, I'd still like to hear more about this paper and from your end, uh, some of the key notes that you think should be sticking out for everybody to look at. So, first of all, uh, Sarah had started to say that we need actually to reduce the cost of remittances because our our report does actually show that globally you can actually save up to $20 billion if you are just to reduce the cost of transmitting money uh, from one country to another or within, within, within Africa. So there is actually a role for governments, both within Africa and also at the international level, like the G20, uh, to do something about reducing the cost of remittances so that at least you cannot only make the savings of how much money reaches the, 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 the recipients, but also at least be able to make it more efficient for, 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 for the movement of money. So the SDG target of 3% as a cost is achievable. Now, at this point, when we have the COVID-19, uh, we have seen governments in the developed countries actually being able to give big stimuluses. It is possible to give a treatment to the uh, remit and service providers in such a way that it can be easier for them to make it possible for the remitters not to impact the because Our report talks about that. We also talk about the issue of digitalization. Uh, it is possible that digital payment systems uh, can actually be made more operable, interoperable, and we believe that there is actually a role also for the government to make this possible, especially when it comes to the regulations within the regime or within the, the area of the financial, financial technology. We've had the example of an of PESA that can operate in Southern Africa and also in Eastern Africa. But there's also this uh, possibility that somebody who is working in the Middle East, using digitalization, it should be possible for them to efficiently and effectively be able to send money. Lastly, I would want to say that uh, the, the high cost of, more, of sending money within the continent, this 14% cost when it comes to sending money within the, between African countries, that is something that the African continental free trade area can look at. And the good thing is that there is a competition policy that is going to be part of the protocols of the AFCFTA, as well as the protocol on e-commerce. And we believe that are going, these are going to make it uh, possible to have sustainable development in terms of reducing the cost of uh, moving money and the payment systems within, within, within the continent. Our report talks about all this and makes recommendations to that effect. All right, now let's get into that call to action and what we can expect from global leaders and everybody who, who is in a position to put some effect into this. And I'd like to start with Sarah for you. What is for you, what, what would you say is that call to action? Migrant workers are a very important part of our entire the world, quite frankly. So can we focus on migrant workers right now during the COVID pandemic? I think it's important that we ensure that many of them are working in very fragile environments, maybe visas, um, residential work permits. Can governments focus on ensuring that there's a bit more safety for migrant workers? Because the spillover effect of them sending money home, the generational impact that it has is significant. We also know that migrant workers um, might be more fragile than a citizen living in the country, depending on if migrant workers are not a citizen living in the country. So as we're, we're ensuring that governments reduces barriers that impede their integration into the national workforce, they are like times 10. What impact a migrant worker impacts times 10 other people around the world that we can't see that, um, that web of network that they have, but they're very important. Let's also look at remittance service providers. It's gonna be important as, as Stephen said, to ensure that there's some tax incentives for them to reduce the cost of sending uh, migrants sending money home, even at this COVID time. And when COVID is over and the crisis is abated, we can increase that 
that 0% reduction to back to 3%, which is our goal. Um, digitization is working. Um, African governments have started institutes in digitization. Nancy talks about M-Pesa. In Nigeria, we have mobile money providers. But I think it's time for governments to reduce the barriers to accessing monies lower than $100. Yes, we have the KYC, know your customer, because that was instituted for to ensure that we have um, better uh, prov provision for, for corruption. But at a time like this, with small amounts, like $100, $70, $200, we should reduce the barriers so that the migrant can walk in there, send the money home without extraneous um, things that they need to do. Um, and let's talk about the costs. So the world has come together, the G8 came together in 2009 to reduce the cost of sending money both abroad and internal um, from 10% to 5%. They ask that that money be that percent be reduced over five years. It's more than five years. We're in 2020 and that has not been achieved. So we need to see more political will from governments to really target that 3% fee of sending money for migrant workers and remittances to become a reality. Remittances become our lifeline for many economies. They're lifeline for many people. People are squeezed on both ends, reduced incomes. Um, an inability to get the safety nets that many countries are trying very hard to provide, but they're not reaching everybody. Remittances are that stopgap. So we need to really focus on remittances. It might be also helpful for the ministries of finance to know that remittances inflow is more than um, donor aid. It's more than private capital inflow. In Nigeria, it's as large as our budget. So remittances are nothing to be toyed with. We really do need to focus our energies on ensuring that access to it is enhanced, barriers to getting it is reduced, and there's support for migrant workers all around the world. All right, Nancy, your, own, your call to action as well. Yeah, I think I'd like to echo what Sarah has said, and I think uh, just uh, to also just give my personal experience because I've also like lived in South Africa and I, I've experienced uh, the challenge of actually sending money back home, uh, like if it's small bills or big bills. I think uh, the most important thing is to just look at the safety and, and, and security of migrant workers, particularly um, those whose uh, status has changed during the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. I mean, it's important for, for governments to work together and see how they can support um, uh, these migrant workers who some of them are homeless, some of them actually have no money. I mean, the, they don't have anywhere to stay. I mean, we just need to see how we can support them and ensure that um, they can they can be able to, to stand on their feet as, uh, as we figure out this pandemic. And then secondly, looking at the ease of sending money after we recover from this pandemic. How are we actually going to move forward with sending um, sending money uh, intra Africa or or beyond because as as as, uh, as we've discussed it's it's very challenging for for somebody uh, based in the Middle East or somebody based in uh, in South Africa or Namibia to send money uh, in, in in Kenya I mean you just need uh, you, you just need easy platforms that somebody can be able to send money that wouldn't need like lots of know your customer information that will inhibit you or put you off when you want to send money so we also just need to see how can we come up with uh, with uh, with measures that can just make sure that we can actually address that quickly because the money is actually needed urgently so if if it takes long i mean it means people are going hungry people are unable to People unable to get medicine and then lastly I think it's just looking at how we can be able to work together and ensure that we get to the uh, to the three percent I mean within Africa it's still very expensive to send money and we need to find a solution where African governments can talk to each other we have the African continental free trade agreement that uh, that uh, that is currently in progress we just need to see how we can actually be able to just have a borderless africa where people can actually be able to move in and out the issue of transfer of money in and out of banks within the continent also how we can actually be able to sort that so i think if we can look at that uh, stories such as the one that we have of isaac who's um whose uh, income in uh, in durban south africa is actually um 
supporting I don't know over a thousand people is is now cut and uh, um, and and the people who is is actually supporting are actually um, like not receiving any money they don't have any food because he's not able to to support it um, uh, is also something that you also need to consider because the, the, the remittances is not just, uh, I mean, most people when they hear their what they just think of it as high level, but there's a link in terms of the other sectors in the economy, the other sectors that rely on that uh, money that's sent as capital. So if you're looking at it from infrastructure to uh, infrastructure developments of like the real estate, for instance, in Nairobi, where you're having uh, most people who actually um, uh, migrant workers who are sending money and uh, building their apartment blocks and office complexes if you're having them also yeah. just uh, investing their money in agricultural projects in, uh, in in various counties if you're not able to have these people supported uh, moving forward then it means that all the vital sectors that they've been supporting will crumble so we just need to look at how we can actually sustain uh, sustain the remittances flow within the continent and beyond. Definitely the impact of the remittances is widely spread felt there across uh, the board. And Stephen, as well, I'd like to get your call to action as well. Oh, thank you again. Uh, the, uh, the, the global leaders just uh, had a big conference last week, uh, the Financing for Development uh, conference, conference uh, during the General Assembly meetings. Uh, they were virtual, but they were able to meet. And, uh, and the, during that conference, one of the key things that came out was the importance of remittances when it comes to financing for, for development. Uh, so there is there are recommendations that uh, are there within the SDGs. We talked about it here. Uh, also, there are recommendations within and targets within the SDGs when it comes to how you treat um, migrant workers. Uh, so for me, the, the call to action is for the leaders to be able to move ahead and work uh, together to meet the, the commitments each of them has made under uh, signing the global goals and also of the outcomes of the Financing for Development Conference um, uh, last week, which uh, also talked about how to ensure that uh, we safeguard and we say this lifeline uh, through, through remittances, among other ways of uh, financing development uh, in developing countries, especially countries uh, countries in Africa who are suffering uh, immensely because of COVID-19, uh, because uh, the impacts of COVID-19 are appearing more with a human face when it comes to the part of the economy, uh, not so much in the number of deaths that we are seeing uh, in, other parts of the, in other parts of the world. So the global call to action for me is for the leaders uh, to listen to their own voices and meet the commitments that they have made under the SDGs and uh, also from the conclusion of their conference uh, last week on financing for development where remittances was part and parcel of the conversation. Definitely quite a lot there. Let me just run through some of the, re the recommendations I also see here from your paper. You're calling on governments to promote the digitalization of remittance value chains to increase volumes, reduce cost, and enhance convenience of sending money. Governments should offer tax incentives to remittance service providers uh, that encourage them to lower transaction fees and relax stringent know your customer regulations. Sarah already mentioned that, and countries should ensure that migrant workers are covered by social protection stimulus programs and extend visas so that migrants can continue to work and send money home. Just a few of the recommendations from that very interesting paper uh, from the one organization and uh, yeah, UNECA talking about uh, remittances. And for my guests, uh, thank you so much for being a part of the show. Definitely very interesting insight we've put forward there. And I hope that policymakers and people in the position can listen to these recommendations and come and to some um, re um, results for the Ivory families who are, rely on these funds uh, for their daily upkeep. Um, I've been speaking to Sarah Maka Ubabe. She's the Nigeria director for one campaign. Uh, also, Stephen Karingi, the Director for Regional Integration and Trade Division at the Economic Commission for Africa. And last but certainly not the least is Nancy Onyango, the contributing editor and writer at All Africa. I'm afraid that's all the time we have on the show today, but definitely very interesting insight. And it's one of the topics I would definitely love to revisit again because I understand the wider impact it has in families here in Africa. And that's it on Beyond Markets. And thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can catch the show at 5 p.m. West Africa time daily. And I've asked access to all episodes of Beyond Markets on our website, that's at cnbcafrica.com. For me and the team, enjoy the rest of your day.